<laughs> I know that Venerable Chanda did say that they're all anonymous, but you know, it's very easy to test for fingerprints and for the... <laughs> No, we'd never do that. I notice it's easier for me to focus on the movement of body parts while doing breath meditation because it's more fun. Depends what body part is moving. <laughs> but yesterday you emphasized the importance of focusing on the breath itself, which I find more difficult. I wonder what to choose as an anchor. What to choose as an anchor is whatever is in front of you right now. Ah, oh, excellent. You finished it very quickly. Excellent. No. Mango. <laughs> so, it's whatever is in front of you right now. That is the best anchor you can ever have. So you don't choose exactly what object it is. You just make sure that what's there right in front of me, that's what I watch. If it happens to be the breast, fine. I often say, if ever you're driving me in a car somewhere, mm -hmm. please don't watch your breath. Please watch the traffic. <laughs> okay. But anyway, if you can get that, then it makes it much easier, especially, you know, the focus of this retreat is to make peace before you die. You know, when you are, um, what's that story about how you want to die? I think it was actually Bob Monkhouse. He once said, I want to die in my sleep, like my uncle did. Not screaming and shouting like all the people in the bus he was driving at the time. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that's my character. <laughs> so anyway, when you are close to death, you can still meditate. Sometimes on your breath it's not comfortable enough. But you say, what's in, what's in front of me right now? What am I aware of right in this very moment? <coughs> An important thing is to be kind to it. When you're kind to it, you soften it and the intensity of any pain or fear sort of starts to get less, less, less and less. And you find it's easy. Which means no matter where you are, how you feel, whatever state of body or mind, you can always meditate as long as now is the only time you have. What's in front of you is the most important and the most important thing to do is to be kind. Very simple to remember, very effective. Don't always have to watch the breath. And find then the breath comes to you. Very easy. Hmm. How can you feel compassion towards someone who's hurt many people, like a serial killer, for example? This is an interesting one because it's um, something that uh, I felt quite passionately about as a teenager when I used to see the news and see, you know, stories of people like this who'd murdered and, you know, basically destro literally destroyed someone's life and caused so much <coughs> anguish for the families. And I remember most people responding really indignantly, like, how could somebody ever do that? And I used to try and say to my parents, imagine how much they must have been suffering to, to do something like that. Because I knew for myself, you know, that when I have feelings of kindness and compassion, there's no way I can do something like that. Like if I'm happy, right? All I want to do is share that happiness with others. So what kind of mind state must somebody be in to actually be able to kill many people? We can't even imagine, you know, for that time they've lost their mind, they've lost their humanity in a sense. And I think the more we practice, the more we see how even slightly harmful thoughts hurt us, first of all, before they hurt anybody else. So I think this is one way we can start to have compassion, to understand that that person is suffering deeply, maybe they don't even know why, and that they've been brought up perhaps with a lot of trauma. Quite often people who end up in prisons I think it's something like 70% of people have some sort of trauma in the past. And also of addiction, you know, often when we're addicted to drugs or whatever it might be, it's usually stemming from some kind of unresolved trauma or some kind of conditioning that tells us we're not good enough, you know, and that's made us hate ourselves. So they actually found out with addiction that um, connection was the cure. 
And there were all these experiments done, I think, in Spain by somebody who um, discovered that giving people community service and an opportunity to do good was much more effective than putting them behind bars. So we can understand, you know, imagine how, because it's so incomprehensible, what kind of state of mind you'd have to be in to do something like that. It wouldn't be one you would enjoy. <laughs> so this is how we can begin to have compassion, at least. Okay. Ahem. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Once I have done everything I can do, I know deep inside that I need to be patient and just wait. However, my staff can become restless and want further action. I have explained that non-action is also a course of purposeful action. However, non-action is sometimes viewed as a weakness by others. As a result, I may lose the support of my team. What is your advice to handle this kind of situation? If it is a team, then just make that decision together. That's what we do in monasteries. I have a big monastery, but I'm not the boss. That's why it's lovely. I'm off here in UK, I haven't got a clue what's going on in <laughs> Perth. <laughs> And life is so much more easy. <laughs> so when I'm away, who's the boss of monastery? The Sangha there. Mm -hmm. They make the decisions. Which means they all join together to make these decisions. It's hard to blame anybody. Because you know, the problem rests with us. In any team, it's nice, you may have like a leader, but the leader is just you know, where the buck stops. Mm -hmm. I always... It's strange. A lot of time people don't like to be leaders because they don't want to take the responsibility of receiving the blame. A lot of times people also don't like to receive the praise. That's one of those weird experiences. When I got given a medal once for doing something or other, and then I gave my speech at a formal ceremony, and I said, I don't know why you're giving me this medal. There's many more people in the community, much more uh, community service than I do, much more vision, much more effort. I don't know why you chose me, but nevertheless, I couldn't have done it without the help of all my friends. That was my speech. And next year, another gentleman got the medal. He really deserved it. And he did an amazing job for the community. And he said the same. He said, it's like stole my speech. <laughs> <laughs> he said, I don't know why you're giving the medal to me. There's so many other people in the community who do much more than I do. And I couldn't have done this anyway without the help of all my friends. And I realized that for most people, they tell the same speech. And what actually happened was some very smart people in the university had checked me out and thought, yes, I deserve this. And so they awarded me this medal. So I, I learned from that, any time that people praise me, I say, yeah, thank you, I deserve that. Can you do that? Can you? That was an excellent lunch you gave today. Thank you so much. <laughs> 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 yes, you could, well done, thank you. And that's very, that's a nice thing, when you can actually accept praise as a team. All of you, many of you are volunteers for Anacampa. It's amazing what you've done. Can you accept that praise? If you do, you don't get big head. If you accept praise, you get a big tummy. <coughs> <laughs> Anyway, was that answering the question? Probably yes, not. Probably. Okay. We don't have a lot of time. Okay, go on then. All right. <laughs> you spoke of nimittas and jhanas. Is this what people mean when they mention the concept of stream entry? Thanks. It might be, but uh, that would be kind of misled. <laughs> so this is just part of the path towards disappearing and stream entry, 
I like the word stream entry better than stream winning because it sounds like you've won something, you know, and you've got a, a prize. Um, stream winning is actually, stream entry is when you enter and you leave many things outside, including this uh, delusion of a sense of self. So it's actually letting go of certain fetters, what we call fetters, that, um, specifically the fetter of doubt, um, the belief that rites and rituals or any kind of observances can be a cause for liberation or can be sufficient, and also this uh, understanding, basically taking what is not self, what is not personal, which is not any kind of essence, as me and as who I am. And it's when those things have been uprooted that stream winning happens. So, and it's a very profound stage that most of us haven't experienced. Some of us may have. <laughs> um, and nimittas and jhanas are something that you experience along the way. So they're kind of other smaller stages of disappearing, which are very helpful in empowering the mind. And of course, jhanas only happen when the mind's free from five hindrances, which uh, distort perception. And the reason that they're so important for stream winning is that without uh, overcoming the five hindrances, it's impossible to see things clearly enough to understand that what we see is not actually a self, it's not permanent, and it's a cause of suffering. It is suffering in, in and of itself. So, I mean, Ajahn Brahm is probably much better to answer that, oh, no. but maybe that'll do for now. <laughs> okay. Okay. Venerable Ajahn, as a scholar of both the Dharma and of physics, have you found any connection or explanation of dark matter? energy with karma or the science and or the science of Buddhism. Thank you for your consideration of this. Okay, one thing which you always find in Buddhism about, about the, uh, the origin of the universe or the fact that each one of you can totally disappear, vanish with nothing left at all. That's called parinibbana. You see, that's impossible, you think, because one of the basic laws of physics is that mass energy can never be created or destroyed. And that's a basic concept in physics. So sometimes I thought if mass energy can't be created or destroyed, where did all this mass energy in our world come from? And I remember doing a, a, a conference lecture with our local um, uh, professor of uh, science, a physicist. And I told him, I said, well, look, you can't create mass uh, or energy. What happens if you have like the negative energy, negative mass energy and positive mass energy? That's a concept which is real. Even just anything which has got a weight to it, like this, a bell. To actually to get this out of the atmosphere, out of the gravitational field of the Earth, takes energy. So it's got much more energy now. When it's up there, it's lost a lot of energy, so its mass must decrease. So, only a tiny bit. What would happen if the mass energy of the whole universe positive mass energy and the negative mass energy, what if that would totally balance out? So you can imagine everything in this universe, including dark energy, everything, all came together. And it wouldn't be like a black hole with a lot of energy. It would come together and go poof and disappear into a zero mass energy sum. We come from nothing. We go back to nothing. I kind of like that idea. <laughs> <laughs> and the end of the universe. This is my science lecture in Buddhism. Have you ever figured out, if you go far enough in a, some sort of magic spacecraft, the end of the universe, what would it look like? Would it look like you know, sometimes here in UK, you can see these enormous fences with people 
patrolling it with machine guns, saying Department of Defense, you can't go any further. Would there be this, this big wall at the end of the universe with all these signs on there saying you can't go any further, end of the universe? How could you have an end of the universe, like a limit to its space? And if there was, what's on the other side? That's one of the reasons why that the solution to that problem, because we know there's a very wonderful proof, I think it's Obler's paradox, if I can remember it correctly, that this universe must be finite. There's only a certain amount of mass energy in this universe. It's not infinite, it can't be. But, what's at the end of this universe? And the answer is, I remember just one of my theoretical physics professors coming in to teach us this. He said, the answer is, look at a football. A football, or let's get bigger than that, planet Earth. Planet Earth has got a very limited area. We all know that because, you know, house prices keep going up. <laughs> <laughs> it's got a limited area. And you can actually know the area of this universe, but it's got no edges to it. There's no end to it. Imagine a little ant going round and round and round and round. He thinks that it's infinite. But it's just because it's bent in another dimension. And that's like the universe. It's got no boundaries, but limited space, limited uh, volume. What about time? <coughs> if time has got limited duration, but no boundaries to it, no beginning, no end. I kind of like that. That's beautiful. It does away with the idea of an Armageddon, the end of time. It does away with the idea of a, a being who started all of this. It's a much more beautiful concept. And a lot of time, all these big metaphysical problems are often solved by just expanding the way we can perceive our world. What else is there? Dark matter energy. And the science of Buddhism. Yeah, I think that's about as much as I can say about the science of Buddhism. But Ajahn, really cool. yeah. if there's uh, infinite space, infinite uh, volume, did you say? No. no, volume is limited, but the... There's no boundary. No boundary. So some people could say that that means samsara is infinite, but there is a way out, and time can end in Nibbana. No, no time does... So how do you explain Nibbana from a physical, a theoretical physics point of view? Time doesn't end. As many people survive after the Nibbana the Buddha of Parinibbana 2,500 years ago, but time hasn't stopped yet. So what happens is that time becomes personal, not universal. And that's just so true with uh, Einstein's uh, general relativity. I may go in a spacecraft and go to, to what's the nearest galaxy, Andromeda. And I, I can go there in five minutes if I could get a fast enough spacecraft and withstand all the acceleration. And I could come back in five minutes, but you'll all be dead by then. I'd only be ten minutes older than I already am. The space and time, our concepts are just uh, not accurate. Even time is not an absolute. Anyway, it's got nothing to do with meditation anyway. <laughs> well, the thing is, Ajahn, I think it's important because some people say that because um, energy doesn't ha comes from nowhere and goes nowhere, basically, yeah. it keeps on going, that that proves that there's something that persists even beyond ah. Nibbana. So is this idea that the positive and negative forces coming together, is that That's an end. related to Nibbana? as you understand. Not really, but close. It means that something which is can stop. Yeah. When everything comes to a balance. Yeah. That's a nice way of looking at it. When it all balances out, then the positive and negative energies inside of you just balance out so there's no more need 
to carry on existing. You've had enough. Haven't you done with existing yet? How many of you really want to get reborn and get reborn and have to wear nappies again? How many of you want to go to school again? <laughs> I've had it with school. I don't want to learn everything all over again. Or do you want more? A lot of times people get reborn because they think they can do better next time. And you find it's just the same. <laughs> or even worse. Yeah, or even worse, yeah. <laughs> Okay, go on. Okay. My mind wants to stay on the breath much more than on my feet during walking meditation. Any advice on to how to make the step more beautiful? <laughs> so I don't know if Ajahn and I might agree or disagree on this. Oh, we disagree for sure. But I think... <laughs> <laughs> what is it? If we disagree for sure, then I don't even know what you're going to say, but I still disagree. <laughs> In principle. So personally, so I think... <laughs> That if you want to stay on the breath, and if that feels natural to you, don't fight it, because the breath is coming to your mind. It's happening naturally. There's no force involved. And I think that's especially true for the middle of a meditation retreat, when you are trying to develop these states of letting go, let's say, and simplifying the mind. And yet I can also see the importance of learning to feel the feet when you're walking, especially in daily life, or maybe even when you're going from one activity to the next, because it helps to ground you in your body. And this is a really important part of mindfulness. So for many people, and I think with this instruction to be aware of our feet, it's just to keep the mindfulness really sharp, which will then feed into the breath meditation when we sit. But if you're already staying with the breath in walking meditation, I would say go with it and maybe just practice the walking meditation at times when you are more engaged in the world. It's a really beautiful calming meditation for when you're busy in life to bring you back to the present moment because sensations are so tangible and so easy to feel. You know, there's a lot of interesting things going on in the feet. And, um, one way that I make my step more beautiful when I am in a long retreat and doing a lot of walking meditation is to kind of imagine that this is my last step. So I just call it last step meditation. And it it's could like, be I your just... last step if you're not paying attention to yeah. where you're going. And, and there was a snake on my walking path. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> there was a big black dugai on my walking path um, last year. Okay. Uh, during a long retreat and uh, so yeah, you never know. But the, the point of the last step is not to feel afraid but to really pour all your energy into that step and really give it all the love and gratitude you can and take an interest in what's going on just as hopefully you're learning to do with the breath. So I find this very, um, very helpful in becoming present to the step. And the point of walking meditation is never the next step. It's always the, the little part of the step you're with now. So that's one way to do it. Oh my goodness, two sides. <laughs> Dear Venerable Ajans, the, d the day I started my practice was the day I first heard the word jhana. Today I enjoy meditation in general, but without the prospect of reaching a jhana, I wouldn't have, st I wouldn't have started a serious practice. I understand that? Well, it motivated them. How motivated them? It appears utterly curious to me that something as profound and life-changing as a jhana is as little Uh, it is so little known. Not one person of my friends, family and neighbours, co-workers has even heard of the word or the idea. And neither have I for some 40 years of my life. I began, no, I have met several 10 monks, oh several 10 monks professional meditation teachers long time i'm not a professional i've got no <laughs> qualifications from any university or course to teach meditation <laughs> just been a monk for almost 50 years buddhist meditation <laughs> also in the theravada tradition who have not once in their life heard of the 
They just need to get your Jobs pork. Are, yeah, but it's true. Uh, maybe jhanas are the one thing we really should talk more about to other people. Thank you for being here. Yes, I agree with you. Weird as it may seem, but in Vietnam, they have a joint Sangha there, United Sangha Association in Vietnam, Mahayana and Theravada monks, and they decided quite a few years ago now to ban teaching jhana to lay people. They've changed their, their views about 30 years ago, so now we can teach jhana to lay people. But I thought that was really gross. In the time of the Buddha, people understood jhana and practiced jhana and attained jhana. Even these days, many lay people have experienced jhana. Not everybody, it's sometimes refined, but at least people know about it. And anyway, you look at the books, you look at the suttas, Eightfold Path. What is the eighth factor of the Eightfold Path? Jhana. First, second, third, fourth jhana. Mahamogalana Sutta, asking the, the Ananda after the Buddha passed away, what form of meditation did the Buddha teach? And then Ananda replied, first jhana, second jhana, third jhana, fourth jhana. When you read the suttas, it's on every other page. Jhana, 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 jhana. Jhana, 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 and more jhana. <laughs> <laughs> That's why tomorrow I'm going to talk about that. Yeah. And in the meantime, can I just flag your book, Mindfulness, Bliss and Beyond, because this yeah. is really a manual on proper jhana practice. And these days, anything goes under the name jhana, unfortunately, oh, yeah. because people have sussed that it's important yeah. to the path. So. In US, they call it jhana light. Yes, L-I-T-E. E. Yeah. It's not <laughs> jhana at all. <laughs> Okay. <coughs> Can people who practice another religion or spirituality attain stream winning? Is there another way than the Eightfold Path? Okay, I'm going to stop at that question because that's really juicy and say that yes, people who practice another religion or spirituality can reach stream entry, but only via the Eightfold Path. <laughs> So unfortunately, there's no other path, or maybe fortunately, because it's the perfect path. And the Buddha said in the suttas that it is uh, basically the only path. You know, it's often taught that Satipatthana is the only path, but the real meaning of Ekaya no Mago is the path leading in one direction, because if you practice the Satipatthanas, the four focuses of mindfulness that we discussed yesterday, they have to lead towards liberation towards stream winning. But in and of themselves, they're not enough. They have to be um, integrated into the context of the Eightfold Path. So it's only if you start off with right view, at least a little bit of right view, to understand that there's such a thing as suffering and also a way out of that suffering. And that there is something called karma, whereby people receive the results of their actions. You know, if you do something kind to someone, you can feel that karma straight away. It's instant karma. You feel happy. You feel good about yourself. You feel that your life's going in the right direction, you know, that you have something to offer to the world. And if you do something really mean and cruel, I mean, most of us here would have quite a bit of remorse, I'm sure, because you would feel straight away that that wasn't really living up to, you know, the higher sense of who you take yourself to be. So it's important to have the whole Eightfold Path and that right view then leads into right intention because if we're suffering, if people suffer, the best way to respond is compassion and kindness, right? And letting go as in non-possession, not trying to get more than your share, not trying to kind of fight with other people to get what you want, but to also give to others. And that naturally, if you have kindness, compassion and letting go as your motivation and your intention in life, then naturally your actions of body and speech will be pure or at least becoming purer as you go. And from there, we start to cultivate the wholesome states in our mind, which then lead to more mindfulness because our minds get energized and that leads into deeper meditation of samadhi. So this is the path. And I think in other religions and spiritualities, people do seem to talk about states of deep meditation, 
But the thing that seems to be missing and that the Buddha exclusively taught was this understanding of non-self, that these things are not a self or a higher essence or a god or creator or anything like that, but that they're actually just the way the mind looks when it's been purified from the five hindrances temporarily, first of all. So this is the difference in Buddhism and hopefully when we um, reach these deep stages of meditation, we can have those teachings of the Buddha in mind on non-self, on suffering and of impermanence to direct us towards the reality, the deeper reality of this existence and what it's about. So that's really the difference. And I think in the talk, Ajahn, you once said something really beautiful. Really? That even other religions, I don't know if it was you actually that said other religions. <laughs> but, no, no, he said one thing. It was quiet. definitely you or whoever you tell yourself to be. Okay, you go on. Nobody. Um, <laughs> that even Christianity, or I don't know much about other religions or even Christianity, so I shouldn't speak too much, but they have a little bit of an understanding about suffering, that some things are suffering, some things are impermanent, some things are non-self. But the Buddha used the word sabbe, which means all all conditioned phenomena, that means everything that's arisen, everything that exists is suffering, impermanent and non-self. And this is the real difference. So you did once say in a talk that sabbe is the contribution of the Buddha amongst many other things. So we have to see it in its entirety. And unless you see it in its entirety, you're not going to reach stream winning. So that is the experience of stream winning, that you see suffering completely. <laughs> You see the cause and you see you've actually uprooted the cause at that time. Yeah. So you complete the Oakville path that way. And there's another little piece to this. What is a Pacheka Buddha and how do they reach enlightenment? So this is interesting too because they're usually known as um, self-enlightened Buddhas. But actually if you look a little bit more closely, and I've learned this too through my teachers, who I blame for everything. Um, <laughs> so it's my fault. Even Pacheka Buddhas may have, or probably have, in a previous life, come into contact with these teachings. Because in other places in the suttas, the Buddha says very clearly that spiritual friendships are whole of the holy life. And also that the word of another, meaning the word of someone who's seen the truth, is a necessary factor for stream winning. The word of another and your own investigation that goes back to the source of things. So these two things are actually necessary because otherwise delusion is too strong. If we follow our own conditioning, our own ideas, we're just kind of going around and around. So we need that word of someone who's seen the truth to kind of put a chip in the system, if you like, and start to roll the whole thing back. So, yeah. And usually the Pacheka Buddha is the Buddha fully enlightened but doesn't teach. Mm. Why? What a selfish thing that is, not to teach. <laughs> People think like that, totally mistaken. To be able to teach, if you're enlightened, that all of your will has been subdued. Everything has just so, gone so quiet. All you need to teach is someone to ask you. That's why in the story of the Buddha, you had uh, one of the Buddha's old friends from a previous life under Kasa, under Kasapa the Buddha. Actually, they called him Brahma Sahampati. He wasn't a god, he was uh, a member of the what they call the pure abodes. He was a non-returner. And as soon as the Buddha became enlightened, uh, uh, Sahampati came to congratulate his old, old friend. And he says in a little poem in the suttas there, that we used to be in the same village before. We knew each other as, as really good friends. Now you've been reborn and, and I was a, a Buddha. I'm a non-returner, but congratulations. And also please teach for the, out of compassion uh, for the many beings in this world have got little dust in their eyes. You know, sometimes if the Buddha was born in India, he wouldn't actually be asked to teach in India because people in Delhi have got so much dust <laughs> and, <laughs> and smog in their eyes. <laughs> but it was a metaphor of like, some people are ready for enlightenment, they just need to have a good teacher. 
But you need to be asked, first of all. Some people say, oh, sure, he can make his decision by himself. No, you can't. If you understand what even in jhanas are like, you're incredibly still. And if you're enlightened, that stillness is so profound that you just stay like that until you pass away. Or someone asks you. Okay, anyway. I'll say some more about that tomorrow, I hope. Now, a very deep question. Oh, my goodness. I've come out of a long, difficult marriage. Now when I meet someone new, I tend to analyze and overthink so that I won't do the same mistake again when choosing my partner. Is this okay or do I just let go? You know, one nice thing about the status, the respect we give to women these days, you don't have to have a partner. You know, if you prefer to stay single, there's nothing wrong with that. It's not discriminated again. You're respected as, as much as anybody else. I know in old days, if you were single on the shelf, mm. that was really discriminating. It must have been rotten. If you were a guy and on the shelf, that wasn't so bad, was it? But the, sort of the, uh, the discrimination we gave to women in those days meant that people think they have to find a partner. If you don't want to, you don't need to. And there are, advantage, there are advantages to being single. If you find a good partner, fine. But if you don't find any parter, partner, even more fine. <laughs> <laughs> You've already been there, done that. And Lord, But they found one, Ajahn. Oh, they have found a new one, yes. okay. <laughs> I should read the end of this first one. You found a new one, great! <laughs> <laughs> Does marriage happen according to karma or do we have a choice in whom we choose according to Buddhism? Of course you have a choice who you choose. And also you have a choice on how you develop that relationship. That's the most important thing. I don't know how many of those old stories you've heard of mine about the chicken and the duck? How many of you haven't heard about the chicken and the duck? Have not? <laughs> How many are awake? <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, it's simple things. So one day this... <laughs> It takes a bit of time, but sorry. It does, yeah. Yeah. We've got five minutes. <laughs> yeah, five minutes, okay. Yeah. Do it very quickly. One day this husband and wife were walking through the woods, <laughs> and as they were walking... <laughs> as they were walking through the woods, they heard a sound. Quack, quack. Quack, quack. And straight away she said, that's a duck, that's a duck. He said, no, it's a chicken. She said, it's a duck. No, it's a chicken. It's a duck. It's a chicken. It went quack, quack. It's a duck. No, I'm sure it's a chicken. Had an argument almost. And then she because she was the wisest, she looked at her husband. And she realizes arguing is not going to do anything except to split them up. So she looked in his eyes, squeezed his hands gently and said, Darling, I think you may be right. That is a chicken. And it went quack quack again. <laughs> the moral of that story is, who cares whether it's a chicken or a duck? <laughs> Is that a good cause to break up a happy relationship? And number two, just because it goes quack quack doesn't mean it's a duck. <laughs> I told that story for so many years. Back in Perth, I've got an internet article about a little duck who was orphaned and the little duckling was brought up by chickens. <laughs> and it's a duck, but it goes quack quack. <laughs> so don't ever think that your partner must be wrong. Then you can have some peace and harmony in marriage. And have a lot of fun as well. All right. Okay, go on. Excellent. This is a great question. Why don't you want to be reborn if you're so happy and blissful? <laughs> That's why you're happy and blissful, because you don't I want to be reborn. I was going to answer that. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't refuse. Okay, I'll get another finished. question. Okay. <laughs> But yeah, the reason that you're happy and blissful is because you're letting go of attachment to the world. That's precisely the point. It's not that the happiness and bliss makes you want to cling to the world. It's more that you're letting go of the happiness 
that comes through the five senses, which is not really happiness compared to the happiness and bliss of the mind. So this is why <laughs> there's bliss in the first place. It's because you're disappearing from the world. Yeah. And you don't, want no, you don't not want to be reborn. It's just something that happens. A process has begun. And without craving, it's not possible to come back to this world. So not wanting to be reborn is actually not the way. <laughs> if you don't want to be reborn, that's you called vibhavatanha, and it brings you back again. So we have to make peace with this existence. We don't push it away or condemn it, but we do turn our minds in a different direction to find the happiness of the mind. Dear Ajahn, <laughs> can you tell us about the process of dying and how I can be helpful to a close one passing away? That's kind of a serious question. No jokes, Ajahn Brahm. Okay. No jokes, no jokes. <laughs> Guaranteed joke, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, to be helpful to a close one passing away. Please go up to them. This has happened so many times. Go up to them and give them permission to die. Oh. It's a beautiful thing to do. The first time that happened uh, in, to one of my disciples, this young man, he was an American man uh, with an Australian wife, and he had this white water rafting company. It's a brilliant little job. You know, he would go to some of the most amazing places in the world, and you know, all his clients would pay you know, for him to take them white water rafting. He did that with his wife, and having a wonderful life together with his wife, and then he got cancer and nothing they could do to, could stop the cancer developing. So I was going to see him and counselling. But then, you know, he was wasting away, as people sometimes do with cancer. And she was looking after him so well. And when I went to see him one evening, she said, you know, he's still alive. Doctor can't understand why. And then it became quite obvious to me. And I asked the wife, have you given Steve permission to die yet? She understood straight away. She never answered me. She just jumped on the bed and put her hands softly around his very gaunt body and said to him, Steve, it's okay. You can die. I'm ready for this. You won't hurt me. Because a lot of times people keep on living because <coughs> they don't want to hurt the people they love the most. In this case, his wife. So it's okay to go. You can die. And he went that night. It's kind of beautiful. Imagine that's you on your deathbed. All these people you've cared about for so long, the last thing you want to do is hurt them and create more misery for them. So that's one of the reasons why I give people who are close to death permission to go. Sometimes they recover straight away. It takes some stress away from them. That's a good sour. Um, actually, maybe I should just. Um... Okay. <laughs> okay, go for it. <laughs> yeah, I will. If mind is not interaction with body and surrounding, then what is the essence of mind? Does mind change during our lives? Of course it changes. It's just a process like anything else. My mind was really smart doing theoretical physics when it was young. You give me a question on theoretical physics, I will, I will, it will change, it will be wrong, I'm sure. All the stuff of your mind is a process which grows like everything else. It grows and decays. There's some parts of it which are more important than it's uh, some of the... Th who are you anyway? Who do you take yourself to be? You said, oh, I'm, I'm good at theoretical physics. Not anymore, I'm not. I'm not a theoretical ph physician. I used to be good at soccer. You give me a ball in front of me and I'll probably miskick it. <laughs> probably kick it through the window or something. All that stuff which I used to do, even my mind, my skills in my mind, a lot of that is gone. Your mind changes. That's why the Buddha said, your mind changes so much every day. It's really not really valid to assume this is who you are. You might as well admit your body is who you are. At least it changes slowly. 
your mind changes so quickly, even during one day. Okay. Should we try and finish what's here? Finish? Yeah. Okay, I'm going to ask this to you, Ajahn. Okay, go on in. What is enlightenment and are you enlightened? What is enlightenment, <laughs> Mama? I am not anything. What is enlightenment? Enlightenment is not a state. Enlightenment is a disappearance. It's a vanishing. So if you ask that question to anybody and they say they are, they are wrong. That's an easy way to see who's not enlightened. Ask them. And if they say yes they are, absolutely they're wrong. Are you highly eliminated, Ajahn? That was this monk, uh, this Sri Lankan monk, who was a bit of a rebel, that's why I liked him. And he said, when anybody asked him that question, he said, no, I'm not enlightened, I'm highly eliminated. <laughs> <laughs> not illuminated, but eliminated. That was kind of nice. Mm. What is enlightenment? Enlightenment is, again, when your identification of being somebody or owning anything is totally vanished. Who are you? Imagine if you've got no identity of who you are. It's like you can be anybody. You don't have to be someone. That's kind of cool. That's how I can be a sort of a comic sometimes. You know, I was actually uh, offered a job once. In Australia, the, the best um, comedy uh, centre is called the Melbourne Comedy Club. And that's where all the comics in Australia, they, 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 they come from there usually. <coughs> and one day this uh, TV personality heard one of my talks and he came up to me afterwards and said, you know, your timing is excellent, your material is unique. <laughs> I want to offer you a job in the Melbourne Comedy Club. <laughs> I was, honestly, that's not made up. <laughs> and I said, I, I think I'll stick to my day job. <laughs> <in a month." laughs> What's the difference? <laughs> if you go to the Melbourne Comedy Club, you get paid. True. In this job, you don't get any pay. <laughs> but you right. get job satisfaction. Mm. It's not just job satisfaction, but the retirement ben <laughs> benefits. The retirement benefits of being a monk or a nun are out of this world. <laughs> All right. Okay, go on. I really want to finish this, but the, this is very quick and this is very quick. Okay, go on. It's actually a big question, but I'm going to condense it enormously. Where, yes, how to start Buddhism and practice? Where is now? How is by coming here? And in essence, the beginning of Buddhism and practice is making peace, being kind, being gentle. So just... That's Bring nice. it all down to that, and you can't really go wrong. Keep right. it simple. But don't keep it too simple, otherwise people won't need to come back to Gano Kampa to listen to more talks. True. There you come. No, no, it's just okay. very similar to the other one. Dearest Venerables, when a monastic in the Theravada tradition is dying, do they choose to be buried or cremated? I prefer to go in the mulcher. <laughs> it's environmentally much more friendly. If you get buried, it takes ground which can be used for cultivation of like vegetables or something. And if you're cremated, that's really bad addition to the problem with climate control. So, so what you should really do is just somehow recycle it. The mulcher is really easy. I d oh, over in Perth, we have these recycle bins. And they're big enough for me. <laughs> you just put one in on a Wednesday. I think Wednesday they get collected. And then they deal with it. It's much cheaper too. So that's what, that's what I'm going to do with Arnold Chanda when she... Thanks. <laughs> in Perth. I always wanted to go in Perth. <laughs> you mean Perth forever? Yeah. Recycled. That's right. If the body is left alone for any time so the life energy can fully leave, Many thanks. Yeah, this is an important part. Any doctor knows that the death is a process, not a moment. It takes many minutes. You ask any doctor, what was the time of death? They say sometime between uh, five past five and <laughs> ten past five. <laughs> they can't give an actual time. Mm -hmm. So your last thought is not such thing as a last thought, it's last thoughts. And the other thing about death, which is 
fascinating. I'm sure any people who work in palliative care or in uh, hospices, you may have seen what is called these days terminal lucidity. That means the last few moments, you may be in a coma for, for hours or days. The last few moments before you pass away, you're clear. You can remember everybody. It's a beautiful thing to see. Anyway. All right, last yeah. one. How can you deal with your loved ones dying? Rationally, I understand there's no real birth and death and believe in reincarnation, but that doesn't change the feeling of pain and sadness because of missing their presence. So, <laughs> yeah, intellectualizing these things never works because really what needs to be addressed is not even the death of the loved one, but your own feelings. So I would say, first of all, really see if you can open your heart to your own pain, your own sense of missing. What is it that's missing and how does it feel? And can you be kind to that? Because it's so important not to condemn any emotion or any feeling, first of all, but to learn how to embrace it and befriend it. So this is the first thing I would say, but also when you're not feeling sad, see if you can bring up beautiful memories of that person and what they meant to you in your life. Yeah, because there's so much to rejoice in. There's so much they've given you. And maybe if somebody's given you great spiritual gifts or a sense of acceptance or a sense of kindness, you can actually keep that alive by trying to bring out those qualities in your life. It's then as though their presence in your life has shaped you into a better human being, somebody who can give some of those gifts that they gave to you to others. And another thing is when you're missing a person, that's because you had them, but maybe at that time you didn't really value them as much as you could have. And I think at that time it's really lovely to see who is in your life, not just look at who's left, but to see what you have around you, the people that you, know, you care about and maybe haven't really noticed or valued enough. Because sometimes we can get obsessed with a particular person, right? Especially if it's a partner that we've been with for so many years that we forget to see that we have beautiful friends or children or neighbors who are trying to be kind. So see if you can really value what you do have in your life so that you, know, you can just get the best out of what's there right now. So don't condemn any feelings of sadness or, or missing a person. It's completely natural and it will pass. And at the same time, allow yourself to feel happy that they were there in your life. Because sometimes I think we deny ourselves that. And it's okay to rejoice. You don't have to suffer. It doesn't serve that person in any way. Yeah. They wouldn't want you to be miserable. They'd want you to be happy, right? So that's what my advice would be. All right. Okay. Ta-da! So the questions are now dead. <laughs> are you happy? Yeah. <laughs> okay. okay. So now we can do... How long? 20 minutes? Yeah. Okay. Can we do some meditation and end yeah. with a blessing? Do the blessing. What do you think about doing the metta sutta in English? Okay, then yeah. Turn the day. Yeah, okay, yes. Shall we do that? Yeah. So just sit for like... Quarter an hour? Yeah. 20. So we're going to sit quietly for 15 minutes and then chant loving kindness. For all those people who have survived and And, and anyone died. who can chant it or knows the words can join in. That would be really What Ajahn nice. Chah taught me if you want to join in the chanting, just move your, your jaw. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> he did say that. So when I was a young monk learning the chant, that's what he's told me to do. Don't just sit there with a, a flat mouth. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <clears throat>
So now you may open your eyes. And those who know the meta chant in English, you may join in. If you don't know the words, you may hum the tune. <laughs> This is what should be done by one who is skilled in goodness and who knows the path of peace. Let them be able and upright, straightforward and gentle in speech, humble and not conceited, contented and easily satisfied, not busy with duties and frugal in their ways, peaceful and calm and wise and skillful, not proud and demanding in nature. Let them not do the slightest thing that the wise would later reprove, wishing in grandness and in safety. May all beings be happy. Whatever living beings there may be, whether they are weak or strong, omitting none, the great or the mighty, medium, short or small, the seen and the unseen, those living near and far away, those born and to be born, may all beings be happy. Let none deceive another or despise any being in any state. Let none through anger or ill will wish harm upon another, even as a mother protects with her life her child, her only child, so is a boundless heart, should one cherish all living beings, radiating kindness over the entire world, spreading upwards to the skies and downwards to the depths, upwards and unbounded, free from hatred and ill will, whether standing or walking, seated or lying down, free from drowsiness, one should sustain this recollection. This is said to be the sublime abiding by not holding to false views, the pure-hearted one, having clarity of vision, being free from all sense desires, is not born again into this <laughs> I would do three he's, or hers, or him's, or whatever, I don't know. <laughs> or they's. Or they's, yeah. <laughs> Excellent. So we're going to end the day with yeah. a few words from Shell. Yeah. And with the questions, I apologise if we didn't have time to answer the questions in the depth which they really require. 
but sometimes we don't have that much time. We want to give people some energy as well. Is that okay? Yeah, very good. <coughs> Carry on. <laughs> Perfect. Um, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Um, so uh, just a quick logistical thing. If we can just tidy up after ourselves this evening, including taking any mugs or glasses that might be around in the library and outside up to the upstairs kitchen, I'd be very grateful. Um, so just another little reminder about Dana, and also we have people online as well. So I just wanted to say some other ways of how you can support Anu Kampa Bikini Project and how important it is to support the Bikini Sangha and give opportunities to women to ordain as bikinis. Um, I'll speak a bit more in detail tomorrow, but there are people in this room, including myself, who have been considering taking full ordination. And this Go is <laughs> not quite yet. We're not there yet. <laughs> but we're really fortunate that Venerable Chanda is here, and Ajahn Brahm so, uh, sent her over here because without Venerable Chanda, there would be no opportunities in the UK, and there are so few opportunities worldwide. So Anukampa is such a special project. So there's other ways that you can donate. So you can donate through our website, which is anucamperproject.org forward slash donate. You can make monthly donations. So those of you that perhaps when I've said about giving done, it feels a bit awkward because you might not have the money to give. Even just giving the equivalent to a, a coffee a month, so like three pounds a month, would be so gratefully received. Those of you where that sounds easy, £10, £20, that sounds easy, £100. <laughs> sounds easy, £500. <laughs> I have to say it. Um, but every penny is so gratefully received. Um, there's also other ways to support. So uh, you can contact team at anucamperproject.org if you wish to offer dana, so food dana. And that can be, even if you're abroad, offering uh, lunch donations. We get some really lovely deliveries the evening before from people abroad for um, the lunch dana for Venerable and the guests. Um, also, you can offer... Uh, shopping vouchers so that the lay guests that are staying at the Vihara can pop out and get any uh, items that are needed. Um, you can also, there's a needed items list on the website which is updated with things like household items, toiletries and things like that that are needed for the Vihara. Uh, there's like eight things. You can uh, just go to the website. Just, just go to the website. That again. So the website is anucamperproject.org and if you wish to donate, it's slash donate, but there's all of those options. Um, and yeah, of course, you can volunteer with us. Um, so you can volunteer your time as well. So do contact team at anucamperproject.org. Um, if you can volunteer some of your time, um, and also um, if you wish to come and visit Venerable Chanda and serve her at the Vihara, not I must stress, it's not visit. So yeah, serve the Sangha, not just Venerable Chanda, because next year as well, we're gonna have more bikinis. Um, but also it is to serve the Sangha. Um, so whilst it's not just popping in, having a cup of tea with Venerable Chanda, it's actually <laughs> looking <laughs> after her. Thank you. <laughs> but we do get to have a cup of tea with her, which is great. Um, and for those of you in the room, we have got the Dana uh, set up outside uh, with the card reader. Um, and if you are a UK tax payer, please fill out the gift aid forms either online or here on the envelopes because the UK government gives us 25% extra so <laughs> it's great she's good uh, is there anything else you need to say uh, can I just say one thing thank you so much <laughs> I just really want to say thank you to you for your support yeah. Shell, and to all the volunteers and uh, to all of you for your practice and I also want to stress that even for those who are in here, must be the minority who don't want to ordain, right? <laughs> <laughs> even for you, it's not about the individual. It's not about me. It's not about others who want to ordain. It's about having people who can practice deeply enough, even if you're not yet stream winners and fully enlightened, but deeply enough and devote their life to the practice so that we can keep on spreading these teachings. 
because it's the teachings that liberate. It's not a being. It's not even an Ajahn Brahm who can give us the, the key. You know, we have to put them into practice. And it's the teachings, it's the Dhamma that we're trying to spread. So we do that through establishing a Sangha, and in particular, the Bhikkhuni Sangha, because the Buddha said you need four limbs, the fourfold assembly. It's like four legs of a chair. You need lay women, lay men, bhikkhunis, fully ordained nuns, and fully ordained monks. And for anyone who is gender non-binary or transgender, we want to give you a chance as well. Maybe this is not uh, specifically listed in the Buddhist text, although there is a lot of talk about people with different sexual orientation and different genders as well. It's a little bit hard to decipher, but as a marginalized community myself, and a marginalized person being the only bhikkhuni in the country, I don't want to perpetuate the same systems that discriminate. And to the best of my ability, I want to try not to do that and to learn how not to do that, and it's a process. But um, we want to include everybody as best we can because everybody has the potential for awakening. And uh, however many steps we can take toward that is wonderful and valuable and life-changing for someone or other around the globe, if not for you, for those you serve. So, um, yeah just wanted to plug that, especially for the people listening live, and maybe Ajahn Brown can say a couple of words on why you think it's so important, since you have a bit of clout. <laughs> and look, there's so many monks' monasteries, I know that because I'm a monk, and they get well supported, but how many bhikkhuni monasteries are there? Run by bhikkhunis, for bhikkhunis, it's that's incredible that they've been uh, marginalised like that. I know one of the reasons for that, we just chanted it. Whatever living beings they may be, omitting nuns, <laughs> let none deceive another, or decide any be in any state. <laughs> That's really discriminating. <laughs> That's why I didn't like chanting that. Yeah, we used to fight about that. I used to go, omitting oh, monk. Yes, monks, <laughs> let monk deceive another, or deceive... <laughs> let monk surrender all real world. Yes, yeah, right. So anyway, no, it's, it's incredible. We're supposed to be a spiritual path. And sometimes it makes me embarrassed to be uh, a spiritual leader. That, what's the point of being a senior monk if you can't do something? And unfortunately, I do the best I possibly can, but it's for those people who've got some spare cash in their bank. You can't take it with you, but it can be to create a beautiful forest monastery, not a detached house in Oxford. It's nice as it is, but in detached, it's terraced. Oh, terraced, whatever it is, but it's not a forest. <laughs> <laughs> and similar to the forest monasteries which the monks have, yeah. then you can have quiet peace, and it's people can go there, and it has a huge benefit for society. Be before we didn't have any bhikkhunis here, or people who wanted to become bhikkhunis. Now there's bhikkhunis, there's people who want to become bhikkhunis, who just got no place to house them. So if you possibly, possibly can, it'd be great to collect some money. You may know somebody who's wealthy and rich, you're dying, and you tell them what you want. <laughs> if you want to get a good rebirth. <laughs> <laughs> If you want, I can actually get them a get out of jail free card sort of thing. <laughs> and just lastly, to say that this is not because bikinis want big houses. This is the opposite. It's for the seclusion. It's for the solitude. And it's also for everybody here, you know, so that you can come and stay and you can have a break from this busy, hectic, smoggy world. Mm -hmm. You can come and stay in a tranquil place and, re and restore yourselves and also practice the whole Eightfold Path. We've yes. been talking about that as the essence of Buddhism, right? And the practice starts with kindness, compassion, letting go. So in a community, we can support each other in that practice. And we can practice the whole Eightfold Path, not just meditation on retreat, but making it part of your life. So it's for everybody. And um, it's already wonderful. This is like a mini version, isn't it, right now? But we all go back and stay in separate places. But yeah, there'll be a place where we can gather together. And we already do in Oxford, with several of you come through quite often. and. Uh, Hopefully we can expand. So thank you so much. And I think uh, hopefully that was entertaining and not just a big plug, but that was also from people online, which we value very much. And uh, yeah, I know many of you couldn't join us in person, um, but we feel you are there. So, And there's one more day tomorrow.
So see if you can make use of the evening to continue developing wholesome states. And we'll see you tomorrow with extra energy and maybe a little bit more loving kindness orientation as well. And worse jokes. Oh, no. <laughs> Out of loving kindness? Out of loving kindness. All oh, right, okay. As long as it comes from loving kindness, that's okay. So, see you tomorrow. <laughs>